Hey everybody, how's it going? Today I would like to discuss something that a lot of people have asked me to discuss, which is the Mac Studio storage not being user upgradable due to a software block and how anti-repair this was. Uh, I am probably going to surprise a lot of you with, the, with this video, and all I would ask of you is that you please just watch it through to the end, or don't watch it at all. So this article says that a Mac Studio requires an IPSW restore after changing its SSD modules to ensure that they are readable and able to boot. Running a device firmware update restore using the Mac OS IPSW package for the Mac Studio should enable the machine to boot from a different SSD, provided that both of the modules are of the same size and make, meaning that storage upgrades still appear to be feasible. Despite being easily removable since it's not soldered down, the Mac Studios SSD storage is not currently user upgradable due to a software block, YouTuber Luke Miani has discovered. It says initial teardowns suggested that the Mac Studio storage could be upgradable since it's not soldered in place. Each Mac Studio contains two internal SSD slots, and the SSDs themselves can be freely swapped between the connectors. In a video on his YouTube channel, Miani tested if the Mac Studio storage is user upgradable in practice. He wiped the SSD of a Mac Studio, removed it from the machine, and inserted it into an empty SSD slot in another Mac Studio. But the Mac status light blinked SSD. SOS and would not boot. The Mac Studio recognizes the SSD, but Apple's software prevents it from booting, suggesting that this was a conscious decision by Apple to prevent users from upgrading their storage themselves. On its website, Apple claims the Mac Studio's SSD storage is not user accessible and encourages users to configure the device with enough storage at the point of purchase. And uh, so one of the things, there's two things I want to discuss here, and it's probably going to uh, surprise a lot of the people that are in my audience. Now, I'm, I'm, ha I'm both happy and sad at the same time for entirely different reasons that you may think. So when you read the comments, one of the things that I'm happy about here is that even on a site that is very, 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 if you have Mac hater, neutral, Mac fanboy, even on a site that is very Mac fanboy, people are responding to this with, a, with I think, is a healthy level of health of skepticism, which I think is good. So when you read the comments, it says, translation, greed, the EU will love this. I remember the glory days of being able to buy a low-spec Mac and upgrade the RAM and drive. Pretty odd that a professional machine would be aimed towards it. Of course they would block it. Sorry, how is this modular? And then the Apple user woke up from their dream. Of course. And the comments in this thread, there are some that are fanboy, but it's mostly a 10 to 1 ratio of people that are pissed at this decision or think that Apple was doing it maliciously to people who were, who were being uh, fans of Apple. Now, I don't think that this was done maliciously. I think it was based on the type of design that they put into the computer. I don't think this was done because they said, screw you being able to do your own pairs. We want to be the only people who can do it. Uh, I think this is actually based on the design of the machine. And one of the things that you really need to understand about this and the newer Macs is that what you're taking out of there is not an SSD. It is basic memory modules. Now, this comes from Hector Martin at Markin42 on Twitter. And I will read it and I will link down below. It says, there are, there's YouTube drama regarding swapping Mac Studio SSDs, and he puts it in quotes. These are in SSDs. These are raw storage modules. You wouldn't expect swapping chips between SSDs to keep your data, right? Same here. You need a full wipe. The SSD controller is a part of the M1 Mac slash Ultra, which is the chip that is on the motherboard itself. So when you are swapping that, most people think when I'm unplugging something from a slot, I'm unplugging the full SSD, not just the chips themselves that have the data, but the controller is somewhere else. Usually when you're unplugging an SSD, you're unplugging the controller as well as the chips on it. Here, this is a fundamentally different architecture for many different reasons, and part of the way that Apple de deals with this entire system is they have the controller for the storage on the processor. So it says, reminder that Apple Silicon Macs don't work like PCs and you shouldn't expect them to. It's not Apple being evil, it's different. If you try to blindly apply x86 world concepts to them from how they boot to how storage works, you're going to be very confused. And they work better in many respects. For example, you wouldn't be able to recover from corrupted raw storage on the majority of SSDs you have to throw it away and buy another one. Apple Silicon Macs do a low-level wipe and you do a DFU restore, so they can. The individual that we're talking about here is somebody that is doing a lot of work to port Linux to these new Macs. So that is how he is getting all this experience by trying to do all the work that is necessary to actually allow you to use other operating systems on these devices. And he says, 
Fun fact, M1 Pro Max MacBook Pros with the same setup with twice the physical chips for four T80 models. I found this out the hard way twice. First, I turned off the second storage PCI Express bus and only four terabyte models worked. Then it turned out four terabyte plus takes longer to in it and U-boot was timing out. You actually get cool diagnostics out of the embedded SSD controller when it crashes, by the way. This one was a bug I ran into in its firmware. Turns out if you do an ugly shutdown very soon after startup and the last ugly shutdown was unclean, it gets confused. And he posted a picture of the debug info. This happens because it's running a cleanup recovery process and it ends up bracing the NVMe disabled and getting into a bad state and timing out. I figured out that if I used a clean shutdown command properly, it cleaned up and worked. Per the NVMe spec, this is a bug, but it's not terribly surprising one. Easy to work around once we switch to the other clean shutdown mechanism, so no issues there. If you run Ayashi Linux, you actually get these messages from the NVMe controller straight in your D message. Bet your x86 doesn't log its internal diagnostics to your systemd journal. That, that is pretty cool. Also, judging by the firmware, there's a way to get it to spit out a full event log in JSON, of all things, with detailed stats on everything that's happening, but haven't figured out how to enable that yet. If you want to play around with these storage modules in Studio, you should know that one, you definitely need to do a full DFU erase, and two, if you populate both slots, they definitely need to be the same size, and they might need to be the same vendor. There are several, because again, do remember that the actual controller is integrated into the processor here. Not sure if top-level controller cares about mismatched NAND vendors, just pointing it out since it might, though ideally it won't. Apple sources its raw flash from different vendors. You can find the module level controller firmwares for each kind in the restore RAM disks. Basically, if you populate a config that Apple would ship, I'd expect it to work given a full erase. If you try to do something weird, chances are good it won't. To clarify, the above firmwares are for Apple's raw NAND controller bridge, which is embedded on package with the raw NAND flash. The top level SSD controller is separate. The raw NAND controllers are called three, uh, S3E, S4E, and S5e. The top level SSD controller embedded in the M1 SOC is ANS2 and runs Apple storage firmware, also RT kit based. Yes, Apple puts a freaking ARM64 inside each flash chip in your machine these days. That's how they roll. There's also at least 12 of those ARM64 mini cores inside the M1 Max. Yes, it has more ARM64 coprocessor cores than ARM64 main processor cores. One of those is ANS2. Now, uh, there are many, many, many times where I point out the issues that I have with Apple and the things that they do. When they tell a company that makes a charging chip, don't sell this charging chip to anybody else, and then I am forced to open up iPhone XR charging cases, throw away the battery, rip the chip off the board so that I can fix customer computers, that sucks. When they will not give access to schematics or even an iPhone charging port inside of their own authorized or independent repair provider programs and then claim to legislators, we give everybody everything they need. What are, the, what are, you, what are those people complaining about? That sucks. Uh, but it's important to also be honest about reality. Here, this is not a case of somebody there rubbing their hands together and going, yes, you will never be able to replace a drive outside of an Apple store. Ha ha ha. Rather, it's a case of the specific architecture they have gone with, which, by the way, is a very impressive architecture. When you look at both the efficiency of these processors as well as the performance of these processors, it is incredibly impressive what they've been able to put into a laptop, much less what they're putting into these desktops. They are accomplishing that by having a very specific architecture that is different from what you're getting on many modern PCs. And that architecture does things a little bit differently. One of the things it does differently is when you unplug that drive, you are not unplugging an entire drive. You are unplugging the storage modules, not the entire thing with the controller. So the fact that you have to do a little bit of work in order to get something else to work is something that is going to be expected. Again, when it says here that you are going to have to do an IPSW restore after changing the SSD modules to ensure they're readable and able to boot, that is a pain in the ass. Yes, it is an annoying pain in the ass. But what... It's inherent to the architecture. Again, this is not a case of somebody just flipping a switch and saying, I want to be an asshole today. How can I be an asshole today? Oh, I can keep Lewis from being able to buy the chips he needs to do his job. I want to be an asshole today. How can I be an asshole today? Oh, you know how we used to ship Apple service diagnostic? You know how you used to be able to just plug in a little USB drive and see the sensor failures? Let's make it connect to our own system that requires you be authorized, log in every time, verify that you're an authorized repair center to make it more difficult for somebody like Lewis to deal with the censorship. There are, there are serious issues that I have with the company, but it would be disingenuous of me to immediately say, like, use this as a right to repair issue when, in my opinion, it is not. As long as they make the tool available to do the restore, 
publicly and easily, I have no problem with it. Now, to be clear, this is not my first choice of computer. It's not my first choice of computer, and it probably won't be your first choice of computer either if you're somebody who watches this channel for a number of different reasons. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to come out here and just blatantly lie about what's going on because that's what you what people expect. A lot of people know that I have issues with Apple as a company. I have issues with how they treat their customers. I have issues with how they treat independent repair shops. And this really, really very well does fit the narrative of there being evil and anti-repair to the point where, again, the top voted comments on an Apple fan site are saying that this is about greed not about a new architecture. The EU will love this. Again, this is, this is going to be um, a way for them to get regulated. And of course, they would block it because you know, they, they, they don't want you fixing your own stuff, which again, I do believe, but this is not a specific, this, is, this would be a bad example for a case of that. And uh, again, to be clear, I would prefer that the drive be more easy to, 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 to transfer. That would be my preference. However, when you are buying a machine that is based on an entirely different architecture, that is based on the SSD controller being a part of the processor, you are buying into a system, in my opinion, at that point where if there is slightly more maintenance to be done because the SSD controller literally is no longer on the drive as part of how they perform, the, you know, how they decided to build the system, then you are indeed buying into this as a system. Uh, and I don't think that that is horrible. I think it's really important that we be honest about the things that Apple does that are wrong or the other things that other companies do that are wrong and also honest when they have done something that seems like it could be anti-right to repair, but is actually for another reason. Because if we're not honest about these things, we will lose the trust of people that actually know what they're talking about and we will also lose the trust of people when they figure out, wait, you, 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 you uh, expected us to get really mad over this thing that is an absolute nothing burger? I'm never going to trust you again. So I think that's really important. Now, I am very happy that people are having this system of healthy skepticism. I really am. When I used to read stuff like this on the front page of Mac Rumors, every single top voted comment would be defending Apple, defending them, saying the right to repair people are idiots, blah de blah de blah There was no sense of healthy skepticism. And I notice that in our society a lot nowadays, whether it comes to companies and their products, whether it comes to car manufacturers and cars, or whether it comes to politicians. People used to just vote for somebody based on who they thought was the least shitty of the two candidates, they wouldn't go out of their way to identify with the candidate, to make that particular po politician part of their personal identity, to where if you criticize the politician, they feel like you're criticizing them personally. People used to just buy a product that fit their needs. They wouldn't buy a product solely, you know, they wouldn't buy a product and then start defending every single little thing that the company did. But now people buy a product, and if you say one thing bad about them, they take it personally and are very, very much so invested in, uh, in defending the company as if they were defending themselves. And I'm happy to see that we're finally starting to move away from that, that people are starting to question things, that they are starting to be critical, that they are no longer blindly defending a company that may not have their best interests at heart. I like that. I appreciate that. And thank you for doing that. It's just in this case, even I would not be mad at Apple and call this an anti-right to repair thing. As long as they make that tool available so that you can put other storage modules in, and as long as they tell you what the parameters are, so let's say, I don't know, let's say that, they, that you, you really only can use another, like if, if this uses SanDisk, you can only use another SanDisk module. If this came with Micron, you can only use another Micron module. If this came with Samsung modules, you can only use another Samsung module. As long as they make the tool available, and as long as they tell you what it is that you need to do in order to make that solid state drive work again, I have no problem with this. Now, if they did not make that tool available, then we would have a problem. If they were, were not going to make any of this information available so that you don't really know what kind, of, what kind of NAND is in your machine and you don't really know what kind of module you need to put in your machine if you have a need to replace the drive, then we have a problem. But I don't see that happening just yet. Admittedly, they don't make it as obvious as I would like for a company that makes things that just work. I would like that documentation to be maybe a little bit more front and center with the, with the device because an SSD is a, or the, the NAND modules, this is a wear part. This is going to wear out on all of these computers at some point or another. I would prefer that it's a little bit more obvious. But even I'm not jumping down Apple Store on this. So I'm not sure why everybody else is. I'm guessing the reason most of you are is because you're on edge as a result of every single company across every single industry going out of their way to make repairs difficult in general. So I understand why it is when this happens that you jump to the negative immediately. 
I, I'm not going to blame you for that, for having that gut reaction. But I don't think that is warranted here. It is warranted with other actions of the company, but I don't think it's warranted with this one in particular. And I think the more that you read about this architecture and learn about this architecture and understand about it, the less mad you will be at this particular instance. So what I would ask of you, let's focus on being mad at these companies when they do things that are actually anti-repair, that really have no good reason behind them, when they refuse to acknowledge the why it is they made those decisions and they pay lobbyists to lie to legislators about it. Let's blame these companies when they tell somebody that when Lewis runs a wire across a motherboard on a MacBook board, he's turning it into a PC and then misrepresenting it as a MacBook to his customers, which is fraud. Let's not be mad at them for things that there's really uh, a sound technological reason for why they are the way they are and, uh, and, and go from there. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. And I will link to Hector Martin's Twitter down below. There's a lot of interesting stuff that he posts there on a regular basis. And I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye now.